Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or indeed good evening, depending on your time zone and depending on when you are watching this. It is Friday, the 15th of May 2020. It's the last working day of most people's working week. Happy Friday. I'm James Innes, and this is my daily YouTube show, The Jobs Guru. Please do think about subscribing. In today's show, I'm going to be taking a look at the latest jobs, career and employment news, in particular picking up on a story about a graduate employment prospect. I'll be covering a question from one of my viewers. I'll be talking about ACAS. I'll be discussing the complicated and confusing phenomenon of applicant tracking systems, or ATSs. A lot of acronyms today. And we'll be trying to determine whether a Jaffa cake is indeed a cake, or whether, shock horror, it might actually be a biscuit. I can see I'm going to be upsetting a few people with that one. If you have any questions or comments as you watch, then do please let me have them below. And if you like what you see, then of course, please do hit that YouTube thumbs up. So first, as usual, I've had a good read of all the jobs, employment and careers related headlines. And I have, of course, looked at all the, the main headlines, too. I have to say that I think that today um, they strike a relatively positive tone, you know, mostly focusing on hopes uh, surrounding the approval of a new antibody test for, for COVID-19, again, raising hopes about the, the possibility of some form of a health certificate for those who have contracted the virus. Although that still stands on pretty shaky ground. There's so little really uh, known about the immunity people gain with respect to this particular coronavirus. And there are also some positive reports about progress on the vaccine front and a headline I saw in the Telegraph that London could be virus free by June. I, I, I love the optimism, but I, I will believe that when I see it. So on the jobs, employment and careers front, though, um, a piece in the FT by Adrian Clauser that, uh, that very much caught my eye this morning. Headline, lessons for graduates entering a job market in crisis. Adrian says, the reality facing this year's leavers is likely to be even harsher than the one I faced in 2009. And she's not wrong. I've had, for example, a question from one viewer, which I'm going to try to, to cover uh, in detail uh, next week on this show, where she says that back in February, she was offered a position on the graduate management program with a major recruitment agency chain, and that offer has now just been withdrawn. According to Adrienne's article, um, graduate vacancies are down 66% this year compared with last. It's a desperate situation. And she does conclude on, well, I think it's a, a relatively positive note. She says, they will eventually emerge as my peers and I did, a bit battered, but stronger for the experience. I do hope so. In yesterday's show, I made my opinion pretty clear, I think, in that I, I really feel the government must seize the initiative on the employment front right now and dedicate some time and effort to setting up some proper support for the rapidly rising ranks of the unemployed. This applies equally, if not more so, to this year's graduates. They are facing an unprecedented situation and need all the help they can get as they try to embark on their careers. There was one final thing on the news front, that uh, one final thing that caught my eye. Uh, BBC News published an interesting tool uh, entitled Coronavirus, How Exposed Is Your Job? You just type in your job title and it tells you how exposed you might be as you return to work. I, I can't help but find that a little morbid, personally, but <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's just me. So, on to today's question from one of my viewers. And today, my question is from Brent. Brent in Salford, a city uh, with many famous musical links, including folk singer Ewan McColl, whose uh, famous song Dirty Old Town was actually inspired uh, by Salford. Brent's question. I work at a call centre, dealing with banking problems, and because of the coronavirus lockdown, I'm currently working from home. I've had a few technical issues with my laptop and getting the software to work. Sometimes it's fine, but other times it's not, and our IT department haven't been hugely helpful. My manager has now told me that I have to take the days the tech doesn't work as either unpaid leave or holiday leave. I think this is unfair, and that work aren't properly supporting me to work from home. Who is in the right here? Wow. Um, Brent, yeah. Great question. This is very unfair. You are definitely in the right here. I totally disagree that you should have to take unpaid leave or holiday leave if the company is failing on this front. This is 100% the responsibility of the company to ensure that the employee is provided with the equipment and technical support needed to work from home. Employers are fully responsible for the equipment and technology they give employees so that they can work from home. Uh, they should be discussing the equipment and technology with the employee, agreeing what's needed and supporting the employee to set up uh, any equipment or technology and to maintain it. So what are you going to do? I, I suggest you start by writing a letter, a, a polite, diplomatic, tactful letter, just concisely explaining 
your point of view. This may well do the trick. But if it doesn't, you might need to go further. You might need to raise a formal grievance. Um, you have rights. Your employer must respect them. Now, it's clearly a route anyone would rather avoid going down. But if you are unable to resolve this disagreement directly with your employer, you can, and in my opinion, should contact ACAS. I mentioned them earlier, and I'll be talking uh, further about ACAS in just a minute. I'm always open to interesting new questions for my viewers, so if you have a jobs, careers, or employment-related question for me, then do please type it into that comment section below, and I may well feature it in a future episode of this show. If I do, there will be a Jobs Guru coffee mug winging its way to you in the post. Their arrival from the manufacturers is perhaps unsurprisingly much overdue, but we are eagerly anticipating their arrival at some stage next week. Now, each day, as well as answering one viewer's specific question, I also look into a specific issue which has been raised by a, a number of different viewers. And today, following on quite neatly, in fact, from Brent's question, I am shining my spotlight on ACAS. So what exactly is ACAS? The Advisory, Conciliation and Arbitration Service, which, you know, quite a mouthful, funny enough, people normally just refer to as ACAS. It's a public body with a mission of improving organisations and working life through the the promotion and facilitation of strong industrial relations practice. Now, whilst in the past ACAS handled a lot of trade union issues, most of its work now involves handling via arbitration and mediation small individual cases like, like Brent's, you know, employees claiming their employer has denied them a legal right. Uh, the idea is to have an independent, uh, impartial organisation which doesn't side with either party um, and to help both parties reach a, a suitable, mutually acceptable solution or resolution. ACAS also works uh, proactively and preemptively to help businesses you know, tackle problems before they even arise. By, you know, it has a telephone headline, it provides training sessions, etc. So uh, useful and important organisation. Um, so there we go. Simple as that, but useful to know about. Now, on to the main topic that I wish to discuss with you today. Applicant tracking systems, or ATSs, or to keep it simple, just ATS, it's perhaps not the most exciting of topics, but it's nonetheless a pretty important one if you're looking to put your CV together to get a job, and it's certainly something which confuses, seriously, many, many people. I'm going to start with the question, what is an applicant tracking system, an ATS, and why is it so important? Well, basically, it's a software application used by recruiters and many of the leading job boards to identify suitable candidates for a specific job role or vacancy, and to more efficiently manage a company's recruitment efforts. Clear so far? Well, when a company needs to fill a vacancy, information on that role is entered into the system and every time a candidate applies, their CV is uploaded and passed through this ATS. The system then manages each candidate electronically, issuing notification alerts and sending out automated messages, informing them of whether or not they're successful and enabling the human recruiter to then access the successful ones. Basically, it lessens the workload of the recruiter by automating key processes and reducing the number of CVs that they have to read. Because they could well be hit with hundreds, if not thousands, for any particular vacancy. And it also acts as a candidate database, storing all the CVs that are passed through and keeping the candidate's information um, on record so they can potentially be contacted in future as necessary. Now, as to why they're so important, well, quite simply, if you don't get past the gatekeeper that is the ATS, your CV won't be shortlisted and you won't be invited to interview it. So, Having an understanding of how an ATS fits into the recruitment process is a definite advantage. So, how to get past an ATS and through to the human recruiter? Well, when applying for a specific job role, it's important to understand that the primary functions of an ATS are 1. To pass all text out of the CV that it's uploaded into it. 2. To index that text within the ATS database. 3. To search that text according to keywords and phrases. And 4. To rank candidates for suitability based on those keywords and phrases. Uh, it's also vital to realise that those keywords and phrases that the ATS searches for and ranks are determined by the human recruiter, who will ultimately get to read your CV. And you know, for each different job role that a company or an organisation is recruiting for, they can configure their ATS to search for specific keywords and phrases. Now, it might sound relatively straightforward, perhaps, but you know, there's so much inf misinformation out there with regard to ATS that it's very hard for candidates to know what the truth is. There are many companies out there claiming they can guarantee to write you a CV that will get you past every ATS. But unless they know exactly which ATS a recruiter, a particular recruiter is using and, and how they've configured that ATS, that's, it's an impossibility. It's an impossibility. Their claims are entirely false. So I can hear you asking, if this is the case, how can you possibly help me to ATS-proof my CV? Well, I can't guarantee I can help you to get that one important interview, but I can certainly help you. And I, right now, I can share with you, I think, my three top tips for maximising your chances of success when a recruiter is using an ATS. Now, one... 
Quite often, if the, a recruiter's online application process does use an ATS, the website will actually tell you that. You know, somewhere on the screen, you may see an indicator that a particular ATS is being used. And if that's the case, you can do a click online search and find out as much as you can about that particular ATS. But don't forget that the ATS can and almost definitely will be configured by a human recruiter in ways that cannot be predicted. Two, read the job ad, uh, the job description and the person spec, the person specification carefully, and then read them again within those vital documents, those vital resources, like, like the keywords and phrases that the ATS will hopefully be configured to, to look out for. Three online word cloud generators can be really helpful in identifying the keywords that you're looking for. Copy and paste the details of the job, etc., into one of these and create a word cloud, which will show the most frequently used words in larger text. Uh, the last of the text, the more important the word is to the recruiter, so make sure that your CV reflects that and covers those, those uh, appropriately, but you know, always in context, you know. Um, don't just litter it with, with keywords. You don't just dump in a, a whole list of random keywords, you know. It might fool the ATS, but no, you need to incorporate keywords intelligently. You need to bear in mind that human reader. Um, it ultimately needs to make sense to the human. So let's move on to a quick chat about formatting a CV for ATS purposes. I, I, I refer to misinformation, and a lot of this refers to the formatting of the CV and what an ATS can and cannot pass, you know. You'll see so many uh, resources, articles claim that you shouldn't use colors, tables, graphs, text boxes, icons, italics, borderlines, columns, etc., etc. The list goes on. It basically, you know, if you if you didn't use any of these, there'd be nothing left in your CV. I want to set the record straight here by about ATS by underlining one very simple fact: all text content within your CV can be passed, indexed, and searched by an ATS. Okay, just so long as you haven't written it in some bizarre alien script or submitted it in, in some totally crazy file format. But let's look at just a few of these formatting options and eliminate some of the myths around them. Color, bold, and italics. italics. Yeah, a ATS can cope with that. They don't just read in black and white. Um, more and more CVs use color these days. And some variation in the color and style of the text is absolutely fine. And from the human point of view, it can help to emphasize key points. So not an issue. Tables and text boxes, I hear this all the time. Oh, and my CV's got tables in it. It won't be able to cope with an ATS yet. Now, an ATS may merge or mangle some text included in tables or text boxes, but it doesn't mean it's not that text isn't passable. So you can certainly use them and should use them to keep the CV neat, tidy, and well organized. Graphs and charts, well, okay, we're representing key information on a graph or chart. Yeah, it can really stand out, that's great. But yes, true, when it comes to an ATS, you shouldn't use them completely in place of important text because yeah, it can't search those. Symbols, icons, other, other graphic devices, you know, they're great for drawing the human recruiter's eye to, to, to crucial information like achievements. Um, you know, great trick, I, I approve of that completely, but not an issue with ATS, it'll just strip them out, you know, and leave the important text behind. Do remember, of course, that, you know, whilst presentation is vital, the content is what will ultimately get you the job. So whatever you decide to do with the formatting of your CV, don't ever let that detract from the all-important content. And I can't emphasize enough that your CV well, it might be first read, as it were, by an ATS. It will ultimately be read by a human being, you hope. We're not quite at the point where the entire recruitment and selection process is managed by machines, except for the odd science fiction film. We're not there yet. So I hope we never will be, in fact. So when you, that, that's a whole other topic. So when you write your CV, you should be striving, striving hard to achieve a sort of balance between what the ATS is programmed to look for and how easy this is for the human recruiter to then read and understand, which is, yes, it's easier said than done, I'm afraid. Uh, big topic, complex topic, not necessarily the most exciting of topics, no, like I said, but it is important. The ATS technology is very much on the rise, and I, with each, each month that goes by, I get more and more questions about it. Naturally, I would welcome any thoughts, questions, ideas, comments you may have about this in the comments section below. Now, as you may or may not know, I have written a few career books. In fact, I'm the UK's best-selling careers author. Uh, amongst my titles is the Interview Question and Answer book, available in all good bookshops. And in each episode of this YouTube show, I've been taking questions from that book, looking at how to answer them. All this week, they've been from the chapter Weird and Wonderful Questions. And here's the last one of the week uh, from that chapter. Is a Jaffa cake a cake or a biscuit? Similar questions include, uh, is Coca-Cola the only real cola drink? could argue about that for hours, couldn't you? Apple or Microsoft, which would you use for your business? Uh, again, I think one could argue about that for hours too. Anyway, back to our question. Is a Jaffa cake a cake or a biscuit? Well, we assume here that the organization hasn't got a vacancy in the career pursuit league. 
And this is a, what I'd call a tricky trivia question. You know, and it looks more like something you might discuss over a cup of tea in the staff room, really. But from an interviewer's point of view, it's another way of checking the candidate's ability, that's your ability, to look at a situation from different sides and weigh up arguments before making a decision. It also examines impartiality, and it can give a good steer on how rational a candidate is able to be. Uh, using, you, you might believe this, you can Google it, using the Jaffa is not as far-fetched as it might seem. There was, in fact, a court ruling in this matter in 1991, don't ask me how I know this, where Jaffa cake manufacturer McVitie's and HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, ended up in a tribunal over whether Jaffa cake was a cake, which would have made it, uh, let it be exempt from VAT, uh, VAT payment, or a biscuit, where VAT would have to be paid. Now, the Jaffa guys, they won the court case. Woohoo! So, at least from a tax point of view, it is a cake. So, how to answer? As, as usual, with any question like this, don't panic. Don't panic. What else is there to do? Now, depending on how wide your knowledge of trivia is, you might even be aware of that court case, but it's probably unlikely. Um, so you need to demonstrate the different arguments and then make your choice accordingly. It really doesn't matter whether you're right, right or not. Is there a right or wrong to this? You know, It's how you arrive at your answer which counts. It's the journey, not the destination. In a nutshell, this is an exercise in putting forward arguments from, from two different sides and then making an informed decision. As usual, I have a little example here from you taken straight from my book. I wrote it quite a few years ago. I can't remember myself what it says. So <laughs> here we go. All right, well, there we go. It's a cake. It's a cake, just as in the name. You wouldn't call something a cake if it wasn't a cake, would you? And it's soft, just like a cake. They are just next to biscuits on, in the shops, but that's more down to the shape, not the content. It is still basically a sponge cake with some orange marmalade on top, so it can't just be a biscuit. I also left one out on a plate the other day, and it went hard, just like a cake. Well, I'm glad that my, my, uh, my sense of humour was, was in gear when I, when I wrote that one. A final word of warning here, because this has been brought up with me before. You might think you can get, you can dodge this question, get away scot-free by saying you've never heard of Jaffa Cakes, but your interview will probably then just give you a detailed description of them and ask you to proceed anyway. So on that note, in the spirit of enlightening you further, uh, Wikipedia um, actually has a description of Jaffa Cakes. Yes, I am that sad that I looked it up. Wikipedia describes Jaffa Cakes as biscuit-shaped, circular, 64 millimeters in diameter. Now that is precise, isn't it? It's not 63, it's not 65, 64. Let's measure one later. With three layers, a sponge base, a layer of orange flavored jelly. So it's actually not orange marmalade, my mistake. And a coating of chocolate. Uh, as it happens, I am currently updating this book, the interview question and answer, but working on a brand new edition. So if you have any interview questions which you think I should be considering for possible inclusion, then I'd love to hear from you. Please do let me know in the comments section below. So now that is pretty much all for today and indeed for this week, the first week, the inaugural week of this brand new uh, YouTube show, The Jobs Guru. I'm taking the weekend off and I'll be back on Monday. And so just a couple more things. First, the usual but important YouTube requests, questions, comments about this episode, about the show in general, indeed, you know, about life, the universe, Jaffa cakes, penguins, Yorkies, uh, whatever. Let me have them in the comment section. If you like this episode, please do hit it with that YouTube thumbs up. Do think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't already, and if you have, please do <coughs> ring that bell. Um, I've actually been asked what this says. It says ring for a, a smile. So Jennifer, uh, ring for a smile. Um, ring that bell so you can be uh, receive new notifications when I upload new episodes. And finally, talking of new episodes, let me tell you what is happening on Monday. In Monday's show, I'll be chatting about a variety of things, including the question of whether or not an employer can now force you to continue working from home. You might think that's a bit odd. There's been a lot of talk this week about uh, people uh, wanting to stay at home and being reluctant to go back into the workplace. But it's, you know, it works both ways around. Yeah, there are some employers who actually want their employees to continue working from home for various reasons. And we've been looking into, you know, whether or not they can actually force their employees to do that. And having delighted in a number of weird and wonderful interview questions this week, next week we're going to be looking at some of the toughest and nastiest ones, starting with... Um, yeah, no, I haven't got one. Um, starting with, here we go, imaginary virtual pen. Starting with, see this pen? Can you sell it to me? I'll make sure I have an appropriate pen as a prop on Monday. Or maybe I'll forget, we'll see. Uh, see this pen, can you sell it to me? So that's a good one to start with. It may not seem the toughest of questions, but you know, I'm going to ease you in gently. I'll be tougher and nastier once the week goes on. I do hope you'll tune in. Uh, thank you for watching today. Have a great weekend. Keep safe and be well, my friend. Goodbye.